Right, so <clears throat> now we start chapter 5. We will discuss on dairy microbiology, microorganisms which are associated with milk, with dairy products. But before we go into that main part, we do a review first. Review of basic knowledge on food microbiology. You study already actually, but here it's just to review. So you have a chance to just um, remember what are the important knowledge in this field before we go further. So this will not help you only for dairy, only for milk and dairy products, but also for other products as well. Uh, so um, first part we do review, and then the second part we discuss the microorganisms that are associated with milk, and then we discuss the growth of cyclotrops. What is cyclotrops? We will discuss at that point. Okay, and then we also just go through fast briefly about bactogenic bacteria as well because this is quite important in milk dairy products and also other food products even though we don't want them to appear or to grow in our food but by several chances they can contaminate and grow and cause food poisoning and so on so we just also discuss a little bit about that as well and then we also review about mortitis and the infection of mammary glands of the cows that influence not only the yield of milk but also the composition of the milk and this cause economical loss to the farmers okay because uh, they have to treat the cows they have to separate the cows and then they have to remove the milk cannot sell that milk and so on so it's actually quite um, costly if does happen it's a nightmare for farmers for example right so now we go to the first part which is do some review in this review we will look again the classification of microorganism what are the main important groups of microorganism which are relevant to food we review somehow basic information about bacteria and then we will discuss what are the primary sources of microorganisms which contaminate into food. Microorganisms come into food from which sources. So we can discuss because we know from where they come from. So we can somehow prevent them to come into the food, to contaminate into the food. Then it's also important to discuss the intrinsic factors and extrinsic factors which influence microbial growth. Intrinsic factor means the factor, the parameters of the food. The extrinsic means the parameters, the condition of the surrounding environment, the surrounding environment of the food, the property of this environment. Also influence to microbial growth. When we know this is important because if we want to stimulate them to grow, what can we do? If we want to inhibit them, what do we do? If we want to kill them, what do we do? So we know this factor is also important. Good. And now we go first to classification. Based on food, influence to food, or applications uh, in food, products, and so on. So you can divide microorganisms into four groups. Mold, yeast, bacteria, and viruses. Mold and yeast together, we can call them fungi. Some people read it fungi, some fungi, no problem, okay, but as long as you understand. Mold and yeast are fungi, but the mold are multicellular, filamentous fungi, and the yeast are unicellular fungi. It means only, only one cell. And mold has many cells, many cells. And actually, mold is quite large or quite long. It can be several centimeters even. So we can even see by an, our eyes, we can already see. So in the past, there was actually debate if they should put mold into microorganism or not into microorganism because mold is not very small to be called a microorganism anyway. But then they discuss many aspects, how they influence the food, how can be applied into food and so on. So they finally put mold in this group, microorganism, even though it is quite large that we can see already. 
Right. So yeast and then bacteria. The size of bacteria can be like from 2 to 5 micrometer, for example. Okay. That we cannot see by our eyes. We have to use a microscope. The size of yeast can be like 20 times, 10 times higher than that of the size of bacteria. We can not see by our naked eyes as well. And then viruses are even much smaller, the smallest living being that human know. Okay? And they are obligatorily parasitic, means they cannot multiply themselves in a medium. You give nutrient to them, they cannot multiply in number. They can only multiply when they contaminate into a host cell. So they need host cell to grow. Tức là cần tế bào chủ, they contaminate into the bacteria, they contaminate into plant cells, into animal cells, even cells, then they will multiply and they cause issues sometimes. For example, nowadays we talk a lot about coronavirus. They can go into our body and multiply in number and cause some issue to our health and so on. Okay, right. So this classification is based on taxonomy. We have another classification based on the influence to food and to human health. We have spoilage microorganism, we have starter culture, and we have pathogenic microorganisms. Bactogenic microorganisms are the one that we don't want them to contaminate into the food, but somehow they contaminate and they grow. When they grow into the food, we intake this food, we become sick. Okay, so this is bactogenic. We don't want them to grow or to appear at all in our food. Spoilage microorganisms, when they grow in food, they spoil the food, and then we have shorter shell life. And then we also lose, we lose economical value, okay? We lose money because of them. But they do not cause food poisoning. Normally when they cause spoilage and we do not consume that food anymore, we got it spied already. And now we have another group, starter culture. We use this intentionally to do fermentation. When we make yogurt, when we make wine, when we make beer, uh, when we make some fermented meat, we add microorganisms and we want them to grow so they can cause some changes in the way that we want. So we call them start to culture, chủng khởi động. And this one, vi sinh vật gây hư hỏng. This group, vi sinh vật gây bệnh. Okay. So these spoilage and starter culture can be um, related somehow. For example, even though they are good bacteria, but when we don't want them to grow and they grow, then they cause spoilage. When we don't want to make sour food, when we don't want to make fermented food, but eat lactic acid bacteria, normally in yogurt or in fermented vegetable, for example, then we want them to grow. And we call them starter culture. But in other products, we don't want them to grow. And they grow, then they cause spoilage somehow. Okay. So you remember this three group? And then we also can classify microorganisms based on the tolerance to temperatures. Uh, if they love to live at high temperature, they love to live at low temperature, at, at average temperature, then we give them different names. And then we will see in some next slide how to classify here. Now, we just have a short information on bacteria. First, we look at the morphology. Morphology is the stage of the shells of the bacteria. So most of the bacteria occur in two shapes, like the caucus and the rod. These are very um, common and a lot that we see very often. But remember that bacteria can be in other shape as well. In spirillum, like this, a little bit restricted. And spirocat can be like uh, even further restricted. And we have kind of budding and advantage bacteria. The bacteria with some like extra part like this. And then we have filamentous bacteria. It look like a hair. Uh, filamentous bacteria has also occur. Okay. 
And then we have some names, for example, if we have like Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus, then what? Staphylo, then it look like this. This is Staphylo. And it's look, if it's like this, so we call it Strepto, Streptococcus. So they are coccus, but they are in Strepto in a chain. And this one is, they are linked together, become, it's like um, grapes, you know, the grapefruit. Staphylococcus. Bacteria can be classified based on gram staining. Staining methods, we apply some chemical to stain the cells. And then gram positive will appear in different color. Gram negative appear in different color after staining when we look using microscopy. Because gram positive, the outside most layer of the cell is peptidoglycan. Peptide and carbohydrate together will form a layer. But for gram negative cell, the peptidoglycan layer here is thinner, but there is an extra layer as well. The most outside here is lipopolysaccharide, lipids and carbohydrate together form a layer. And there is quite some protein and so on here right so they are different in structure of the cells and they are they will be different in the sensitivity or the resistance to chemical to heat and so on normally gram negative uh, negatives will be less resistant to heat uh, can be easier to be destroyed for example